good morning, everyone. It is good to have you here with us, however it is that you're joining us. You may have missed the memo this morning and be surprised and say, why are we at, uh, at Janelle's house? Unfortunately, I'm not feeling 100%, and so just want to be on the safe side. Uh, I took a rapid COVID test this morning and everything's fine, uh, but just want to be on the safe side and not put anybody at risk. So I'm glad that you got the memo if you are here in real time uh, and, and are joining us either on Zoom or on Facebook. A few announcements, as always. Uh, the really important one this week is that it is annual meeting time. And so next Sunday will be the annual meeting for La Flesh. That'll be immediately following the 1130 service. And that will be both in person and online. So if you are wanting to join in only on Zoom, not on Facebook, but if you are wanting to join in on Zoom, please let me know and I'll make sure that I have that set up. The following week, the La Flesh and Limerick will switch times so that Limerick can have the 1130 service and have their meeting immediately following that. And so that is April 3rd, we will have Limerick at 1130 and their service immediately following that. That means that the La Flesh and virtual service will be at 930 on April 3rd. Then we'll take a break for Palm Sunday and Easter. And on April 24th, we will have uh, the official board and pastoral charge annual meeting. So I hope that you will come to any and all of them uh, in person or on Zoom. Please, as I said, let me know if you want to be on Zoom and I will make sure that that can happen. Have you ever thought about joining our faith formation committee? Uh, we are looking for a couple of people, one from Limerick and one from La Flesh. And so if you're interested in that, please chat with me, chat with one of the other people who is on that committee. We tend to meet about uh, every two or three months on average and do the worship and Christian education related things of our congregation. So if you're interested in that, please let me know and we'd be, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. A thanks to Dwayne and Penny Filson for doing our tech for us this morning and to all of our musicians. So that is Dwayne and Penny, uh, Gail Morgan and Sherry Sproul for playing and recording our music for us. Uh, this week we were able to use actually services or music from services that we've done in the past. And so we have a little bit of a mixture of all of our musicians. I am so grateful for all the work that they've put in over the last few years recording and, and helping us really build a, a great library of music that we can share with one another. As always, our music license number is A609189 of One License LLC, and our music is reproduced with permission. We begin our worship this morning, as we always do, by acknowledging the territory. And so I invite you to use these words or others, depending on where you might be across this great country. We remember today the land on which we worship. It has been the traditional land of the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, Cree, Soto, and Métis peoples for generations. As people of the United Church, we remember and repent of the harm that has been done to our Indigenous kindred, and we commit to living in a relationship built on love and care for all. So we light our Christ candle today, remembering Christ's call in our lives, that his presence is with us in every moment of every day. Our first hymn this morning is number 402 in Voices United, We Are One. Yeah. 
Jesus is here working for God's kingdom. And so we come laying aside our worldly pride and status. Jesus is here asking questions and pushing boundaries. And so we come leaving behind the powers to which we cling. Jesus is here in the everyday wonders as much as in spectacular signs. And so we come to know life in all its fullness. So come, let us worship. And let us pray together our prayer. You are a God who sees. You are paying attention even when we are not. While we rarely notice those around us, your eyes miss nothing and we give you thanks. You see the needs of your world and the possibilities. You see the fears and strains, the hopes and wonders, the pain and grief. Give us your vision that we may see what you see and therefore love as you love. Amen. Our scripture today comes to us from the Gospel of John as we have been going through John for these last few weeks. We are in chapter 446 to chapter 518. Then he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had changed the water into wine. Now there was a royal official whose son lay ill in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my little boy dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. As he was going down, his slaves met him and told him that his child was alive. So he asked them the hour when he began to recover, and they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. The father realized that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he himself believed, along with his whole household. Now this was the second sign that Jesus did after coming from Judea to Galilee. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew, Bethzatha, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. 
When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat and walk. At once the man was made well and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, it is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, the man who made me well said to me, take up your mat and walk. They asked him, who is this man who said to you, take it up and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is still working, and I also am working. For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. The story of God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Our next hymn this morning is number 136 in More Voices, When Hands Reach Out and Fingers Trace. So this is one of two weeks in the narrative lectionary this year, which focus on Jesus's healing miracles. The other is found in chapter nine of John, and it's the story of a man who was born blind. Because we focused on stewardship for the first few years, we got a little out of the first few weeks of the year, we got a little out of sync with the narrative lectionary and I've had to cut a couple of weeks out of the regular regular schedule. And so I found myself going back and forth this week on which of the healing days did I want to talk about. In the end, I chose today's reading because we get two stories in a shorter period of time than we do in chapter nine. 
but I do hope that uh, you'll take the opportunity to read chapter nine verses one to 41, uh, because there is some really interesting stuff in there. Thomas Jefferson, yes, that Thomas Jefferson, famously wrote what is often called the Jefferson Bible. It's actually titled The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth, but most people call it the Jefferson Bible. In it, he created a chronological rendition of Jesus's life and teachings by melding the four gospel accounts together, literally cutting and pasting with razor and glue his Bible together. In his attempt to create what he considered the pure words and stories of Jesus, and apart from all that the church had added into the narrative over the years, he purposely left out all mention of the supernatural, miracles, or Jesus's divinity, focusing instead on Jesus's teachings and parables. This week, I have wished more than a few times for that razor and glue myself, as I have wrestled with these healing stories. How do I honestly and authentically preach them when I know so many who seek a miraculous healing today do not receive that for which they hope and pray? How do I pre preach these texts or our miraculous healings without how do I pre preach these texts on healing without perpetuating ableist views of the world in which those who do not meet the world's views of quote unquote normal are viewed as less than? And yet I cannot dismiss them, both because they are part of our biblical heritage and because I think they do have something to teach us. But I have definitely been tempted to take Jefferson's approach with that razor and to try to extract those lessons without the miracle behind them. At first blush, these are two very different stories, but when read together, they complement and fulfill one another. One takes place in Galilee and one in Jerusalem, Galilee being the kind of backwater town, the backwater area and towns, and Jerusalem being the center of power. One is a royal official, one is about a beggar, that, those who have power and those who have no power, potentially about a Gentile and a Jew. In, this story, in these stories, we find one where the person asks for healing and one where the person didn't ask for healing. Well, there's one where there's a, a sense of faith and belief, and there's one where there is no stated faith or belief in Jesus after the story is finished. In one, Jesus is reluctant, and in the other, he initiates it. In the story that we read last week of the woman at the well, she and her community state that Jesus is not only the Messiah, but the savior of the world. And I think that this is where these two stories continue to go when they are read in tandem. It doesn't matter who or where you are, Jesus can and will heal you because he has come for all the world. Now, a couple of things about that though. Healing doesn't always mean what we think it does. And we have to search and we have to be open to being found. When I was in school, we often talked about the difference between curing and healing. Curing is what we see in today's story, what we hear Jesus, uh, what we hear that Jesus did when he caused the boy's fever to leave him and the man by Bethsaida to walk. It's a physical change of the body, curing is. Strep throat is cured with antibiotics, a broken bone is cured with a cast. But healing is more and deeper. It is becoming whole. It's an acceptance of what is a strengthening communion with yourself, one another, and God. So someone with a terminal illness may never be cured in the fact that they will still die. 
well, they may be healed when they settle their mind to the reality of death and find that they are not afraid. Someone who has struggled with addictions may not find an easy cure, but they can find healing when they have a community to surround them as they journey in recovery. Sometimes healing doesn't come as we'd expect it to. The royal official, used to having power in most situations, expected that Jesus would leave what he was doing and immediately go to his home to cure the boy. Jesus didn't. Instead, he told the father to go because his son had been made alive. And in that moment, the man had a decision to make. Did he trust and believe in the word that Jesus spoke? Similarly, when asked if he wanted to be made well, the man at the pool of Bethsaida spoke of the curing that he knew and expected, to be the first in the water when it was stirred up. He did not know who Jesus was and so was probably hoping that this man who had stopped to talk to him would take pity on him and help him to the water. Instead, Jesus tells him to take up his mat and walk. And like the official in the story before him, he had a choice to make about whether he trusted and believed in the word that was given to him. Healing does not come in either story as either man expected, but it did come. And as I read the story of the royal official, I have to wonder, if his servants had met him on the road the next day, bearing the news of his son's death rather than his cure, would that have made him believe Jesus's words any less? Would it make me? Would it make you? What happens to our faith when the cure we seek does not miraculously or otherwise appear? Sometimes healing doesn't always come as we think it should, doesn't always mean what we think it does. We have all known suffering. That is a part of living a human life. And whether the pain and sorrow of illness or grief is yours, or you've seen it in those you love, the pain is real. I cannot, nor would I want to deny that. We live in a broken world, but we do not walk alone. I'm also not denying that sometimes cures, sometimes miraculous and sometimes through the work of doctors and, and nurses and medical professionals do appear, but unfortunately they seem to be few and far between in our lives. But more than that, Jesus offers us healing. In him, we find true peace. In him, we are restored to community. In him, we are made whole. And sometimes we have to go searching for it. We have to be honest with God and with ourselves about the places in our lives that we need that healing. Like the official in today's story, we have to seek out pursue and hold on to tightly that which Christ gives us. And sometimes it finds us when we are least expecting it. Like the man at Bathatha, surprising both us and others with its presence. Sometimes it comes in a quiet question. Do you want to be made well? And the command to take off your mat and walk, forcing us to choose faith over fear. Sometimes Jesus searches us out because he knows that we do not yet recognize him or even know to ask for healing. Sometimes we have to be open to that which we do not understand and allow Christ's healing powers to flow through us. And so as you go through your next week, I invite you to think about healing in your own life. Where have you known it? Where are you still in need of it? Is it a matter of making that healing need known? Or is it about opening yourself to the spirit's surprises, being aware of that which is going on in the world around you? 
because the story and the promise of these stories is that Jesus does offer healing to any and to all, and that includes us. And for that, we are grateful. Amen. As people of the United Church, we proclaim our faith in the words of a new creed. And so I invite you to join with me in these words. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, each week at this time in our service, we take the time to be intentional about what we give to God. Sometimes that is our time and our talents. Sometimes that is a monetary donation to one of our churches or to other places where you see God's work at work, life at work in this world. Whatever it is that you bring to God's day, I invite you to think of it now as we sing together our offertory hymn. God, these are the works of our hands and the love of our hearts. We ask that you accept and bless these gifts that we give back to you now as a token of the love that we have for you. May they be used to further your work in this church and in the world around us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Let us pray. You seek us out, O oh God, and bring us together into your community. You do not leave us to walk this way alone, and we offer you our gratitude for your companionship in the journey of life. When we find it difficult to be taught, you persist. When we can hardly believe our eyes, you bring us along slowly. Hear our praise for your compassion and your wonders. We lift up to you those who are looked down upon, who have been infantilized because of disability or economic circumstance, whom we do not recognize as our neighbors. People made in your image. May they know their value and experience love for you and from others. We left up to you those who say things in the systems of this world do not want to hear, and so are attacked as people because their ideas are threatening. Give them your courage to stand firm and speak out. We ask your transforming power to be at work in those of us who find it so easy to refuse to receive the testimony of others 
those of us who speak easily of justice and love, yet drive it out of our community when it's inconvenient. Those of us too afraid to own up to what we have seen, choosing instead to take the easy way out of hard conversations. Those of us who tr trust their own vision more than yours. Heal our hearts that we might turn to you in truth. You are transforming the world one person at a time, oh God. And so we pray for the eyes and hearts to see all you reveal and for minds and wills to live differently according to what we have seen. In the name of the one whose truth dazzles our senses and calls us to live in hope, Jesus the Christ, we pray as we share together his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, friends, let's sing a, a fun song reminding us that we are sent out in Jesus name number 212. Friends, as you go from this time and place of worship, may you go seeking and finding the healing of Christ. May you go open to Christ's presence in your lives in each and every moment of every day. And as you go, may God bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up the light of her countenance upon you and give you peace this day and always. Amen.